Okay, we live, you guys seeing seeing a, a screen? Any thumbs ups there? I'm a, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, so it's a pleasure to be here, although it would be even more of a pleasure if we were actually in person farmer to farmering in a nice um, big group in a room, that would be, that would be much better, but um, this is a good second best, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm going to give an overview, an introductory talk about strawberry production, and um, even though it's sort of introductory, what I'm going to try to do is to step back from it as we kind of go through and um, try to highlight where there's new and interesting information or inter information that's coming out that might be a particular relevance. So hopefully it won't be too dull, even if you are um, somewhat more experienced with strawberry production because I find them to be really um, complicated creatures and there's a lot of different ways that you can grow them. So my brief outline in this sort of quick presentation is I'm going to give some real basics about the strawberry plant and how it works and talk a little bit about the common production systems and um, how those uh, well, we'll talk a little bit about how those can, can vary. Um, highlight some real important considerations with strawberry production and finish with some resources that I hope that folks are aware of. And if not, um, I'll, I'll share them so that you, you have access to them, ones that I think are useful and helpful. So first, in this um, intro to strawberry, maybe we should back up and say why strawberry to begin with. Um, and I think one of the reasons that strawberry is such an appealing crop, especially for organic growers, is that it's insanely popular. Um, and so even though it can be a laborious crop, the labor requirements are actually kind of reasonable compared to lots of the crops that um, diversified operations grow. It has a relatively low investment compared to, again, lots of the crops that diversified operations grow. And um, probably the most significant reason why strawberry, it has a pretty high return per acre. So it has the potential for pretty good profitability. So it it's, can be challenging to grow them, but um, it's pretty easy to market them. So talking just a little bit about the, the strawberry plant, kind of an introduction. This is an interesting plant because we manage it either as a perennial or an annual, but it's one of the few vegetatively propagated plants that is kind of managed more like a vegetable crop than you know our, our real perennial berry, berry um, crops. So, they usually we start with a crown plant, but it very easily propagates and it makes um, runners and sets tons of daughter plants in response to warm temperatures and long days. And there are big differences between varieties in how likely they are to produce runners and their runnering tendency. But basically most of them do produce runners to some degree, this is how they pro they're propagated. And so you can see that not only in the little diagram here, but also um, in this photo of a, a mother plant with a whole pile of daughters around it. When it comes to flowering and fruiting, um, the flowers are produced um, on crowns or branch crowns. There's these trusses that are produced and these clusters or trusses are modified stems. And that very first terminal blossom is called the king blossom, although my longtime research assistant is aiming, Caitlin Ord, who is planning to change this, and she feels they should be called queen blossoms, and I tend to agree with her. Um, the, the, these trusses then, they, they branch and they form secondary, tertiary, quaternary blooms, which make smaller, smaller, and smaller fruit progressively. So those king or queens are the biggest fruit, and then we, we go downhill from there. Strawberries are self-fertile, but um, cross-pollination tends to improve yield, which um, is good because many of us grow lots of different varieties. Flowering is very interesting in strawberries. So 
Um, strawberries are all what are considered um, short day plants. So flower development, no matter what the variety is in strawberry, is triggered by environmental cues. So whereas runnering is triggered by warm temperatures and long days, flowers are a flower development and flowering is triggered by short days and cool temperatures. And that's true for all varieties, but varieties differ in what those thresholds are. So if we think about things um, like um, our traditional June bearing varieties, and that's like Jewel and Honey Eye here in blue, they have a pretty, um, a pretty low day length requirement. So it has to be pretty short days for them to trigger blooms. Uh, Trigger, trigger flowers. So if we look at the growing season and the day length over that growing season, which I'm trying to show here, um, it's and we think about when it's warm enough for things to be growing, it's really only this tail end in the fall when they are triggering the production of those flower buds, which is why we get a big burst of fruit the next June. When we look at the, um, oops, when we look at the traditional ever bearers or um, varieties that fall into this example are things like Tribute and TriStar, these kind of older ever-bearing varieties. They have a slightly longer day requirement. And so what we get is sort of two peaks of production. So they, they can actually, they do form a lot of buds in the fall, but also some in the spring. And so you tend to get these sort of peaks of production um, with those. And we now have also day neutrals, um, which uh, can flower, in fact, all year long. And there is, there's quite a lot of variation between varieties. So that includes modern varieties like Seascape and Albion. And because they have that higher requirement, they can fruit no matter what the season is. If it's growing, growing, they, they have a short enough day to, to form flowers. So the production system that we choose to grow strawberries in has to be matched with the plant and the plant's growth. And there's really kind of two ways to think about this. One is that we can design a production system to optimize the plant's um, nature. And so an example of that is the matted rose shown up here, which is very common here in the Northeast, but not common anywhere else in the country. Or we can design plants to fit the optimum production system. And that's what's done when we talk about a plasticulture system, which does not rely on these runners which like matted row does. Instead, we have to trim off the runners, but it controls weeds and moisture and all kinds of other things that we might like to control microclimate way. And um, so these choosing a production system is always a bit of a compromise. And it's always a matter of choosing the one that best fits your climate and all kinds of other considerations that, that you might have. So I want to talk a little bit and just kind of give a little overview of the main production systems and sort of what their, their cycle looks like. I said mostly we grow in the matted row system here in the Northeast, although that's beginning to change and there's a, quite a bit more of this, the other production systems I'll talk about in a minute. So what this is showing, let me walk through this schematic. This is showing the year from January through to December. And each one of these bars is showing a different year. So in a typical matted row system, we would have prepared ground in the first year. We would plant plants and they would grow vegetatively all that first year. We would mulch them with straw over the winter to protect them. And the next spring, we would remove that straw and they would produce a fruiting crop for three weeks in June and July. They would then grow vegetatively. We might get a second year of production, protecting them for the winter, and we would get a second fruiting year. We might continue that for longer. Um, in organic systems, that's pretty rare. In a plasticulture system, there's a couple of different options and probably 
the most common here in the Northeast for folks that are interested in growing in plastic culture is to use dormant plants, which are just like we a planting stock, like we would use in matted row, where we have plastic culture, plastic beds prepared, and we plant a little later than we normally would in the matted row system, but we would plant June bearing varieties that would grow vegetatively through that first summer. They'd be protected usually with row cover and not straw, and they would fruit a little bit earlier than the traditional matted row June bearers. But this would be an annual production system, one year and done. After that, those crowns compete with each other too much in plastic and um, they would need to, something would need to be done to remove that competition. And this is usually just a once, one year system. And then last, uh, lastly, there is a plastic culture plug plant system. So you're not starting with those bare dormant crowns, you're starting with plug plants, which are rooted, suck, uh, rooted runner tips. And in that case, you could plant quite a bit later that first year, as late as maybe August, maybe as late as early September, depending on where you're located, you would get that vegetative growth through the fall. And then uh, you would get again that production the next spring. And then the very last one is day neutral production. So day neutrals is using those varieties that are able to fruit and flower all summer long. And that would be very much that it's usually done on plastic culture systems where they're planted in the spring and then flowers are removed early in the season, but then they fruit through August, September, October, etc. So there's really a lot of differences between these systems, a lot of different systems we could possibly use. In a matted row system, um, again, this is the most common. We're starting with these bare root plants. We are planting far fewer plants per acre, about seven to 8,000 plants per acre, because we're taking advantage of the fact that those plants are gonna grow and make daughter plants, and those daughter plants are gonna be productive in that system. So I kind of went through the rest of these steps, so I'm gonna kind of skip ahead, but I will say that um, in organic systems, this, this last step renovating and deciding whether to try to get a second year out of that crop is really kind of a decision point. Many conventional operations will keep these plantings for two, three, four, five, even more years. In organic systems, it's harder and I'll touch on why in a second. In an annual plastic culture system, we're talking about much, much higher plant populations. Um, 12,000 to 18,000 plants per acre roughly. And the reason is because we're not allowing those runners to set, we have to actually fill those plants at final density. This requires kind of commitment to having nice equipment that makes good, uh, well-formed beds that shed water and so forth. So it's a bit of a different kind of a, a system. It is possible to get a second year out of these systems, but you tend to get into issues like competition between plants, diseases, and of course, there's a fair amount of labor with runner removal. With day neutral production, you know, the issues and the spacing and the bed preparation are really the same as with the annual production system. The real difference here is that you've got an entirely different production window. So fruit from, you know, really early August straight through till frost, possibly even later with, um, with row covers or with low tunnels or something like that. And it's possible to get second year fruiting in June with some of these varieties. And that's where some recent research has been focused on trying to really look at how suited day neutrals are to production in the Northeast. They're well suited, but they're a very different kind of crop to manage and market than a June bearing crop. Um, lastly, I'll mention there's a totally different production system that I often get questions about, and that's high tunnel production. So when you're producing in a high tunnel, you can plant quite a bit later, mid-September, even to mid-October down where I am, probably mid-September in a, a, a slightly colder area. Um, this is, can result in some earlier harvest. Um, studies 
done some time ago looking at the economics by my predecessor here showed that it really was not a great use of tunnel space compared to some other uses of tunnel space but there's a lot of people that use the system and the reason they use this system is because protecting plants from rain um, and getting earlier fruit and being able to work in the tunnel offers lots of benefits um, aside from just you know lots of production and so forth. So I'll just point out here that um, this is sort of summarizes what I've gone over. So maybe I'll kind of zip past it. But um, I will say that when you are looking at making a comparison between these systems, if you're a conventional grower, they're really very different because the matted row is a very long term system or it can be. And that's less so with organic systems. And the reason is that weeds are um, probably the most common reason for this pl for plantings to lose vigor and um, productivity um, with a matted row. And so we did a big survey of strawberry growers throughout the Northeast last year, and almost all organic growers that are using matted row are only producing for one year two at the most, and they question whether two makes sense. Um, with annual plasticulture or day neutral production, you're kind of like defining that you're only gonna be doing this for one year. Um, so that the differences between these systems tend to, to meld a little bit. And there's lots of folks actually doing hybrid versions of these and transitioning from one to another um, and so forth. And so it, it kind of the lines get blurred between these systems. So I'm going to quickly go through some important considerations um, that uh, that are yeah things to think about when when growing strawberries. I'm going to start with um, plant nutrition. So you would think that there might be some advances in plant nutrition research um, and information, but there are not a lot, especially when we look at organic production systems. Still, our best tools are soil testing before planting and leaf tissue testing. Um, or if we're doing plastic culture production, perhaps more frequently than that, um, but we would still be looking at uh, that would only be useful if you're actually going to be fertigating with some products. recording is back okay um and roughly a third in the late august when those uh fruit uh, when those plants are setting their flowers for the next year um we don't apply anything during the fruiting period and then would apply again at renovation and again during fruit set so that's a little bit different timing than for a lot of our other crops um, winter protection is something that's important with strawberry. Um, it's really not about protecting them from cold, it's protecting them from freeze thaw cycles. And straw is the way we traditionally do this in um, the matted row system. Here, uh, and that's usually quite a thick layer, four to six, maybe even more inches. Once the plants are fully dormant, removed as early as they start to grow again in the spring, usually late March, early April. Um, here at UNH, we're doing some work trying to look at row covers as an alternative um, and trying to understand what weight many growers are using row cover for winter production protection, but there's not a lot of good research out there trying to that that tell us what weight we should be using, how many layers we should be using. And we are trying to answer that question with an experiment that looks somewhat like this one here shown in the picture with lots of different coverings and different kinds of um, configurations. So we should have some really 
good and applicable info coming soon on that. Frost protection is important with strawberries. Um, as I mentioned, those first berries are the biggest ones and they're the most vulnerable to early season frost. Um, strawberry flowers are killed when the temperature goes below 30 degrees, um, which is not unreasonable in the end of May when they're blooming. Um, so this means you have to have a frost protection strategy. Um, often, traditionally, that's been irrigation running the overhead irrigation from when it reaches a certain critical temperature until that ice is melted. But increasingly, growers are adopting row cover as a frost protection strategy um, if it's not too cold. So row cover can protect um, theoretically if it's heavy down to about 24 and a half degrees. Um, and it's possible to use row cover and if that's insufficient to irrigate on top of row cover. So this I, I see as being something that folks are starting to really adopt because that's often not a time of year you wanna be putting a lot of water on the field. So there's a picture of uh, some row cover for frost protection as opposed to uh, irrigation for frost protection. Renovation is another important consideration with strawberries. This is like that annual process of thinning down the beds and renewing the plants so that the matted row planting stays healthy and vigorous. Normally, in a conventional system, this would involve a normal full renovation, would involve um, we removing weeds after harvest, either with herbicides or by hand, mowing, fertilizing, tilling, and then watering, weeding, and fertilizing again through that season. Um, in organic systems, because of weeds and those weed challenges, um, it's most common to use reduced or partial renovation where you are going to narrow up the rows and you are going to control weeds, but you're probably not going to till and mow so that you don't give space for more weeds to come in and germinate and take over that planting. So it's sort of a different process. Um, the la I think this is the last consideration I want to mention, and that's rotation, which is probably the single most important factor for organic strawberry production success. So for lots of reasons, but probably the biggest one is to inhibit buildup of weeds and other pests. So an ideal rotation would look at strawberries and then being out for four or five years um, of strawberries before coming back. Um, in terms of rotation crops, there's lots of ones to consider, legumes, um, several cover crops, brassica crops, but it's um, generally recommended to avoid uh, solanaceous crops because of their susceptibility to verticillium wilt, um, which can be problematic in strawberry. So my very last section of this talk is focused on resources. Um, and I mentioned that I would give you some suggestions for resources if you don't know about them. And um, here on this slide, actually what I'm gonna do, well, I'm gonna do it when I'm done talking, I'll put them in the chat. I have links to all of these in, and I'll put them in the chat for you. Um, I'll just draw these out. Um, in the top left, um, my research associate, Caitlin, put together this beautiful low tunnel strawberry production guide for anybody interested in using low tunnels to try to extend the season. It's super practical information from someone who's installed a lot of low tunnels. Um, and she wrote down all those experiences so that others don't have to reinvent that. Um, in the top here, we've got uh, Cornell put together a nice organic production and IPM guide for strawberries back in 2016, which is a pretty helpful and useful resource, especially from the pest management end of things. For anyone interested in day neutral strawberries, um, Caitlin and I put out a growing day neutral strawberries in New Hampshire, but it applies to the rest of Northern New England too. Um, variety selection and production tips bulletin. And um, it presents some pretty nice results uh, from experiments Caitlin did over a few years looking at the modern day neutral varieties and how they do in this region. Um, so that, that may be useful for some. And then lastly, 
the strawberry production guide that NRAIS put out in, back in the late 90s um, is still kind of a definitive resource. And that segues into um, my, I think this is my last slide here, um, that we're in the process of revising this. Marvin Pritz and David Handley edited this the first time around and they're helping us to revise it this time around. And so, we don't have it ready yet, but it's coming really soon. And it's going to be available in PDF so that you can print it, but it will be available online. Um, and we've updated everything in there. And so the pieces that are really going to be new in this is that there's been a lot of changes in varieties, a lot of changes in production systems, um, a lot of changes in post-harvest handling and food safety, and also marketing and budgeting. Um, we've updated everything, but those are kind of the pieces to pull out. And I think with that, I will stop. I don't know if we have time for questions or if we're going to head right along, but I'm going to put these resources in the chat. Um, and I will let CJ guide us. <clears throat> Thank you, Becky. I think, well, Becky's um, putting some of those links into the chat. If there are any kind of quick questions for her about the presentation, we could take those now. Um, and if you were able to put that, that question into the chat for all of us to see, we can address it. Um, and there's a question that just popped up from Daisy. Could you compare and contrast irrigation versus row cover for frost protection? Well, I can do my best, but I actually would love to hear other people's thoughts on this. So let's, I will answer what I think, but I, um, I do would love to hear this come back in when we have the discussion as well. Um, so when you irrigate, Obviously, irrigation can protect to a lower temperature than frost protection by a bit. So traditionally, irrigation has been used here in the Northeast and row cover has been used. It's really used in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, both of them are an investment. You know, row covers are expensive on a field scale, but they're reusable um, as well and they don't involve applying a lot of water and getting up in the middle of the night to check to see what temperature it is and figure out if your irrigation pump works. So, um, you know, those are kind of the salient points <laughs> that come to my mind. There, there's sort of trade-offs with them, but um, I don't know if that fully answers it, but I, I guess I would, for more detail, I would really love to have that be a discussion point for later. Okay, I've, I've written that down in my notes here for discussing later on, see what, see what other thoughts come up from folks. Um, but I think with that, we could just transition over to Eric Seidman, who's sitting right next to you. <laughs> um, and Eric will uh, give us a presentation about his strawberry production or both of your strawberry production. I'm not sure how to address it there at at East Wind Farm and Eric, you got you and Becky are down in Stratford, New Hampshire, correct? That's right. Yeah. So we screen shared. The screen is shared. You guys can see it, right? We can see it and um great. And and you are on, Eric. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, CJ. Good to see you again. Um uh, most of you probably don't know, but years ago I used to work for Mafka. I was there. Uh, crop advisor for about 30 years, I think it's 34 years, and I retired. Uh, I always had a plan that when I retired, I would become a big commercial farmer. I, I always had a farm going, and I've always grown strawberries during those 34 years and sold them as pick your own, um, and I had this plan that I would retire and put all of my time into farming, uh, and that plan went to the wayside because I realized that when you're 70 years old, um, you really want to slow down more than get bigger. And uh, I'm really full time now farming, uh, but most of my farming is growing food and other things for ourselves, cutting our own firewood. So I married Becky in 2009 
moved down from Green, Maine and started a new farm called East Wind Farm. Uh, most of uh, the farming that I do is growing food for ourselves, but we have two cash crops. One of them is early season tomatoes. We sell them mostly wholesale uh, into a specialty produce market in Kittery, Maine. And we also sell a lot from the farm to our neighbors uh, self-serve in the greenhouse. So they're high tunnel and we get them out very early. Um, it's a heated tunnel. But the other cash crop is the one we're talking about today. And that uh, is a pick your own strawberry business. Uh, it's a very small scale. Uh, it's uh, actually a small part of what I do here on the farm, but it is by far the money maker and what keeps the farm productive. And I think that lots of people grow strawberries and lots of people don't grow strawberries anymore because of the things that Becky brought up and maybe we'll discuss during the uh, discussion section. So I'm going to start uh, with a little bit overview of the whole farm. Uh, we have the strawberries on a piece of ground. We used to grow close to half an acre. We're now growing about a quarter of an acre of strawberries. And the, the other parts of the farm uh, are gardens. You see in the background there, uh, one of our gardens, we have a bunch of gardens, some small and some medium. I think that's our largest one with about a third of it being sweet corn. Um, we also do a bunch of livestock on the farm. Uh, sheep is the major one. Uh, we sell lamb and uh, Becky does a whole lot of knitting and spinning and all the things you do with wool. We also do turkeys and broilers and a handful of other things. Um, but most of our time is actually spent on the sheep or growing vegetables. And then uh, some portion of the time is that strawberry field. When we bought this farm, it wasn't a farm at all. It was a couple living here who one was a Oh, one, the woman worked for a nonprofit and the husband was a uh, contractor and they really just let it go. Um, before they owned the farms, they, they only here for three years, uh, this place used to grow Christmas trees. And so when we bought the farm, it was a mixture of abandoned fields and fields that still had Christmas trees on them, but the Christmas trees were way past Christmas trees. They were too big and that was our first year's work was pulling out the Christmas trees and bringing fields back to production. And so uh, the first step, and this is the most important one in strawberries, is to get the land ready for growing crops. Strawberries are not very weed competitive. And so you have to get the field weed free and you've got to spend at least a year or two years doing that. And during that time, you're going to build up the nutrients and correct the pH of that ground too. And so that's what we did. We uh, picked what ground we're going to use for what. We built fences for pasture, picked out what we're going to use for gardens, and then chose our strawberry field. And actually, we only have one strawberry field here. Um, and we'll talk about that, how that impacts. But um, I guess Becky already brought it up. One of the keys to growing strawberries is your rotation plan. And since we only have one strawberry field, our rotation plan is kind of peculiar. Uh, we rotate in time rather than space. And so we have a strawberry field that is only producing for a year or two, and then it's out of strawberries for a year or two. And then we go back in. This is a marketing nightmare but because strawberries are so popular, it actually works. We're out of strawberries and our, we just tell our customers we don't have strawberries. And then when we go back into strawberries, we just hang our signs back up and Becky does some Facebook work and we have no problem marketing them. It's uh, probably the easiest crop to market. So this is the beginning. We're taking these fields and getting rid of weeds, uh, correcting the pH with limestone. And this picture is me spreading uh, wood ash on the fields and getting the pH, the strawberry field you want to get into roughly around six, uh, pH of six. And then we also had to correct all the nutrients. Um, there are Mafka fact sheets on uh, how to do these things. Uh, I wrote them originally, but now our new crop specialist 
Caleb Goosen is updating all of these. And so I basically followed my own advice and uh, addressed the nutrient problems individually. Um, we use bone char for correcting the phosphorus. Uh, we mostly use potassium sulfate for correcting uh, the potassium and then the limestone and wood ash for the pH adjustment. We did soil tests for the first two or three years religiously and got all of these important nutrients, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, into the optimum range before we did anything else. But probably most important was during that two or three years of preparing the ground for growing strawberries, we brought the life back to the soil. Remember, these were abandoned fields growing all different kinds of weeds in them. And the pH was someplace about four and a half or five, and we had a lot of work. Um, and the main uh, amendment to the soil during this time was compost from our sheep operation. And so we would spread compost um, and grow various kinds of cover crops during this uh, one, two or three years of getting that ground ready for strawberry production. Um, our first tool for, store, for growing the um, cover crops was uh, we planted oats early in the spring. Then we came in with Japanese millet for our summer cover crop because it adds so much organic matter to the soil and really does a great job of competing with the weeds. Also, and probably more important, is actually the time between these different cover crops for competing with the weeds. We'd have a bare fallow ground where we would repeatedly till the ground, trying to get the weeds to germinate and then beating them back with tillage. And then after a week of two or three bare fallow, we'd come back in with a different species of cover crops. Um, we also fed out the cover crops, of course, to the sheep who tended to love the Japanese mill. Uh, at the end of this cover crop, at the end of preparing your ground and getting the fertility in the good ranges and getting your weeds under control and getting the soil life back to an optimum level, uh, we always go to oats. And I would recommend this. Oats are a great fall cover crop, uh, especially for strawberries. And the reason is they die during the winter. And so when your oats are dead, you look at them in the spring. And if that field starts greening up, that means you didn't do a good enough job to grow strawberries and you wanna do at least another year of cover cropping and bare fallow. Um, but if that field doesn't green up and you just have a big field of dead oats, then you're all set to get ready to plant your strawberries. Um, and this is a picture of me uh, preparing the rows for strawberry planting. And this is a picture of planting the individual strawberries. I'm a real traditionalist. Uh, we only went to the uh, matted row system. All of those other systems, I could give you names of people who do a great job with them. I like the matted row, which is the old fashioned New England system. Um, I didn't realize that New England is the only place where people do matted row. Um, I knew California and Florida have an annual system and it's very different. But I thought matted row would be really popular in the Midwest and the mid-Atlantic states. It's my favorite system and I stick with it. Um, and it's actually pretty tough for organic growers to stick with it because of weeds. But here I am, I'm putting the strawberry plants in. We plant them at 18 inches apart. Um, oh, and this, the varieties I grow, um, I've settled on these varieties. This is what we have planted in our field right now, sable is my favorite of all of them. It's an early season variety. Uh, Dave Handley at Highmore Farm did research on varieties and probably 10 years ago now in his research plots that time, Sable was his most productive plant for total production. It was his earliest plant and it's the best tasting plant. And so I always plant Sable. Uh, the problem is Sable is very hard to get. That has to, I actually, the only place I can find it is a place, uh, GW Allen in Nova Scotia. And I share a shipment from them with a couple of other growers. We grow Jewel because uh, Jewel is a beautiful berry. Lots of people like the flavor. I don't like the flavor. It tastes like a kiwi. And um, 
I think it's a little too dark for me. We always put in a couple of rows of sparkle. It's an excellent tasting berry and very sweet. It's a very late season berry. And we only do one of our 30 rows of, with sparkle or two rows of sparkle because it's a really poor producer, um, but it tastes so good. And the other reason, Becky always tells a story, um, I think it was a grandma uh, who said, oh, anyway, when anyone comes looking and they wanna show off that they know the name of a variety, they always ask for sparkle because really that's all the only name they know. And so you always say, oh yes, we have sparkle and you point them to the one row. Um, the other plant we grow is Cavendish, which is a very popular plant among pick your own people, very productive, excellent tasting berry. You have to convince some growers to buy it because it has uh, some white spots on the, plant, on the berries and that turns some people off. And we stuck with Honey Eye, which is an older variety. Uh, it's not a very good tasting berry. Uh, it's very sensitive to the type of soil you have. And for some people, it's actually a lousy tasting berry. On our farm, it's, it's good enough. And the reason we grow it is very productive. Uh, starts early, goes late, and is one of the most productive berries there is out there. So we've stuck with Honey Eye. Um, there are lots of different ones to try. I think there's a fact sheet in New Hampshire. I know there's a fact sheet in Maine that Dave Hanley puts out comparing the different varieties out there. And he talks about taste and productivity and all of the different disadvantages and advantages of the variety. So if you're new, uh, actually, even if you're old and looking for new ones, uh, Dave Hanley probably has updated that. Has he? I think so. The guide has it updated. Yeah. Oh, the new guide coming out has the variety guides all updates. So make sure you get a copy of that when it comes out. Um, this is what the strawberry field looks like after it's planted. The plants are 18 inches apart. They're going to set the runners. If you're tiny or gardener, um, you would set each one of those runners so it's six inches from a neighbor. And that's why you put them uh, 18 inches apart. Each mother plant will put out a runner towards the next one. And so if you put them each six inches apart, then those two runners will be six inches from their neighbor and you do six inches from the side too. So you do five or six runners with each, with each mother plant, six inches apart. Uh, commercial growers, they're not gonna be setting the runners. They're just gonna let them go in and get established. Um, during this time when you're establishing your field and you've just planted, weed control is easy. We set up our G with a bunch of these uh, spring tooth uh, cultivating implements and we can actually just ride over and do a good job. The problem is once the runner's set, there's no more using the G because you have your runners all through the field. And so now you're maintaining your rows, keeping them a foot, foot and a half apart each row and uh, your weed control inside the rows is all going to be hand. So from this point on, it's crawling through the field uh, with a hand toe or pulling them out by hand. And then uh, winter comes along and you spread straw on them to, for the winter protection to prevent the heaving uh, during the uh, winter months. The worst situation is where you haven't put straw down and you get a 70 degree day in the middle of January and then a zero degree day at the end of January. And that's when you get a lot of heaving of the plants out of the ground and death in the spring. But if you're lucky, you get a good field of strawberries. And this is a picture of our field uh, with some of the pickers out there. Biggest problem with strawberries is weed management. Uh, hand weeding is really hard. Um, the cultivation with the tractor only takes place during the, uh, right after the planting. And so your big question actually is after the pickers are all done uh, in the earlier middle of July, you have to decide whether you're gonna go for a second year. Um, we almost always go for a second year and almost always regret it. Uh, your production is much lower because of the weed problems that come in and they're going to set back your planting and your uh, yields. And so I would think the better organic growers have enough ground so they can 
uh, have a field in production, a field in establishment, and the rest of the fields in either other crops or various cover crop regimes, uh, trying to get land ready for planting. Um, we always try to do a second year. And so we actually, um, this year, are looking forward to it because our field looks better than it ever has, which is very odd. I was just talking to Ben, most of our farm that all of the fields that are in cultivation are now fields of gallon soga. But oddly enough, our strawberry fields looks better than it ever has. And so I think this may be the first year that we don't regret trying to get a second year out of an organic field. After that second year, we never try to do a third year. Um, it would be silly, your yields would be a quarter or less of what you would get out of a newly planted field. So because we don't have any other fields to go into production, we actually take our strawberry field out of production and we don't have any strawberries uh, for a, a year or two, a year and a half or two years. And we grow into crop rotation. And our rotation that we do is always oats early in the spring. Then we do a summer cover crop and we've played with all different kinds of summer, summer cover crops. My favorite one is cow peas. And the reason I like cow peas is because they are really good nitrogen fixers and there are not many good nitrogen fixers that grow in the warm month of the summer. We do the oats early in the spring to get a, a good jump, but we take the out, oats out early. Then we have a bare fallow of probably two weeks of tilling the ground, trying to get any of the annuals to germinate and then killing them. And then we come in with cow peas. And then we have a choice of fall cover crops. We'll take the cow peas down in the middle of August and we do various kinds of cover crops. But my favorite one of our fall cover crops is actually a field of oats, which is broadcast over the field. And then right after I broadcast the oat seed, I take a, uh, a cedar and I plant um, tillage radish in rows, uh, probably two feet apart. And you can see here the oats and the tillage radish growing together. And this is a great crop. You got to get it in in the middle of August or late part of August is getting touchy late. And by the time you get to September, it's too late to do this cover crop because the tillage radish seed is expensive and they don't get big enough to make it worthwhile. But uh, this system is really good because the tillage radish uh, does an amazing job of outcompeting the weeds. It actually outcompetes most of the oats and you have a field of tillage radish out there with their tremendous roots that go into the ground, uh, tilling the ground, hence the name tillage radish and also a great food for the sheep. Uh, they like the oats a bit, but they love the tillage radish. And then we go back into strawberries and that's the end there. That's, so we're going back to where I started, preparing the field for strawberry production. And I'll take any questions um, that are quick and relevant. Otherwise, uh, big questions we'll save for the discussion session. Thanks, Eric. We'll see if anything pops up here in the chat box any questions before we move on to ben um, that's right i can stay here eric there is a question that just popped up about how far apart is best for rotation fields to prevent pests or diseases from drifting? Oh, the answer is a tricky one. It's always as far away as you can get. So it's limited. Um, most of your strawberry pests are local and um, strawberry rootworm, um, strawberry weevils, they don't travel very far. Tarnished plant bug does tra travel very far. And so it depends what you're uh, doing in your cover crops, but even more important, it depends who your neighbors are. Um, here we have probably the worst neighbor you can have, and that's a guy who grows hay. And so he mows his hay just about the time the strawberries are flowering and the tarnished plant bug comes over. So it really depends where you are. The further apart, the better. Um, we can't get very far and our rotation is good enough um, 
probably 500,000 feet from any other fields. Okay. Well, thank you, Eric. How about we um, we can transition here and we'll move over to, let me throw my video on, I guess. I'll move over to Ben Marcus from Sheep Scott General Store and Farm in Whitefield, Maine. Hi. Thanks for having me. All right. Now I'm looking for my video share thing that we did earlier today. Um, yeah, if you if you kind of scroll your mouse down to the lower part of your screen, it's the toolbar should pop up. Yeah, with the share screen kind of green in the middle. Yes. Hi. Okay. All right. Here we are. Here we are. Okay. All right. How's that look? Everybody re ready? Yeah, we can see that. Okay, great. Hi, Ken. <laughs> so um, we have been at our farm for this, our, we had our 10 year reunion this year. So 10 years ago, I, my wife and I showed up here. I grew up in Whitefield and um, we, got into farming. We met studying agriculture um, at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. Um, and we came home, or I, I brought Taryn back to where I grew up. And sorry, I have two kids that are getting ready for bed right now. Um, we, uh, we ended up um, on the this farm that we've been on for 10 years so the farmer before me he had always grown strawberries or he started growing strawberries a number of years before me so we had this great mentor going into it um and basically i asked him what to plant in the first year that we started farming and he said strawberries and i said how many and he said five thousand crowns and he basically told me how to do it um so it was a pretty standard system of tillage and planting um we planted out uh, at a foot on center in row um for a bunch of years um and then we and we did it all by hand and then a few years ago we went to, um, I got an old mechanical transplanter and it changed my world. Um, so let's see, I will start out with, um, the, probably the biggest hurdle is just, um, or the biggest limiting factor is land bait, your land base and maintaining organic strawberries requires a lot of land. So uh, 5,000 crowns we were doing on about an acre. Um, and now we're up to, we had a two acre field this year. And I think that's about as much as I want to take care of. Um, so to, maintaining two acres of strawberries every year requires 10 acres of land to maintain a good um, rotation is what I found. Otherwise you end up with these problems. Um, and I'm a one and done strawberry grower. So I grow for, I establish for a year, pick, and then I'm done. I've tried to keep them for two years. This is what I've seen um, is you start seeing pest problems, disease problems. Um, and uh, it's just not worth it. And the yields go down. So uh, field prep. They already went over this. Um, Becky and Eric kind of went over all this stuff, so I'm not going to waste any time on that. Um, 
So the old fashioned way of planting crowns, uh, I figured that we could put in 180 crowns per hour per person. Um, now I have one of these jobbies. This is an old Holland bare root transplanter. Um, and this is a few years ago. I've gotten better at it. Um, I go 18 inches between plants now uh, for a few reasons. Uh, a big one is I found that you have more time to cultivate in the row before you the runners get in the way. So you might get another two cultivations um, before the runners get in there and you're stuck crawling by hand. So uh, I go, I, I, uh, my rows are five feet on center. Um, I used to be six feet. I've kind of standardized everything to five feet with all my other row crops. I grow uh, a bunch of different vegetables. Um, we started doing the hemp thing a few years ago and that's five feet on center. So everything's kind of, um, yeah, five feet's good. The other great thing that I came up with or I didn't come up with it, I copied uh, is laying drip tape with the transplanter. So this Holland transplanter has a uh, boot down in the bottom of that so it makes this furrow um, so at the very bottom of the boot I just drilled a hole through it and put a bolt through that I wish I had a video of that um, and um, and then around the bolt inside the boot I just took a piece of uh, maple syrup tubing um, just to uh, reduce the wear on the drip tape going through. So I went down to Stevenson's farm. They're in Wayne. They're a great, they're great strawberry growers. They're conventional, but they uh, they have beautiful strawberry fields down there. And I kind of went poking around and picking his brain. And uh, he showed me his, you know, early uh, version which is what I adopted. So he just, yeah, he just simply drilled a hole through there, was able to feed the drip tape down through the shoe. Um, and then I have my drip tape coil like rigged up on my uh, roll bar on the tractor. So super simple, cheap setup. Um, I did it because I was doing overhead irrigation forever. And it just uses a ton of water ton of water and it's watering everything and um i have a couple of ponds that i irrigate out of um and i was just draining them and you know last year that wasn't a problem this year but last year was uh, a wake-up call for me and uh water conservation so um <clears throat> so after planting uh that's the, the other thing that actually the drip tape gets rid of is this big water tank that we used to water in. Um, that big blue thing right there. So I don't have to refill that anymore. I have my header line all set up and I can just plug that drip tape right in. And when I get the field done, I can turn it on and it's a beautiful thing. You just see this little strip of uh, moisture right on the crowns and you know I hate plastic but the drip tape I think it's worth it um, so I won't go back I don't think um, you can also fertigate through it which I've done I can talk about that a little bit so um, so the first crawl through the field is uh, picking blossoms um, I sort of gauge my success of the season of how many times do you have to crawl through the strawberry field. Uh, you want to minimize that. Um, picking blossoms is the one crawl that you cannot avoid. Uh, you have to go through and pick blossoms. And at the same time, you do a very thorough 
job of in row weeding. Um, even if you don't see weeds, uh, I have my crew make scuffle every square inch of soil right up to the crown. It's worth it. Um, weeds are uh, their challenge. You're going to hear that a million times. So I bought one of these a few years ago. This is the budding finger weeder. Um, it's great. It, it does get in, in the row. Uh, so I'm able to cultivate with this uh, until the crowns start running. Um, it's it's pretty heavy. I think there's better finger weeders out there now. Um, and I'm kind of looking at getting some of those just because this thing's so heavy. Um, gummy. Um, under the tractor, I can't lift it up really high. So the clearance is not great. Like it's to the end of your row and you're lifting it up. If you have tall grass, it's like a pain in the butt to turn around. Um, with the drip tape header line, I've gotten it caught up on that a few times and that's aggravating. And anyway, there's just better, lighter, simpler versions of the finger weeder um, out there now. So I think it's a great tool though. It's a great tool. This, the finger weeder was invented for strawberries, I'm pretty sure. So um, let's see. So basically it's keeping the field clean. You're pretty much like every week or 10 days, um, you get out there uh and once the you get your matted row established you're always raking in the runners with the cultivator so this is my primary cultivator tool this is the one that austin moore always used it's the one that came with the farm it's just one of those nice buckeye um s tine uh harrows rakes um you just set it really shallow. That's the, there's gauge wheels on this. You want to really do as minimal uh, disturbance as you can. You don't want to bring new weed seeds up to the surface. You're just, um, the basic, the, the primary goal of this for me is to rake in the runner. So um, as the matted row widens over time, I'll remove a set of these tines and I'll widen it out until it gets to like two feet wide. That's what you're looking for in your matted row is a two foot wide row. And this, you can't beat this tool for that. It's the same thing that Eric has on the, on the G that he's cultivating with are these S tine sweeps. And they just have like a, a simple, you know, a standard duck foot kind of sweep on the bottom. Um, you want them to overlap uh each other so when you're setting up your your cultivator rig um you just want to make sure that your cultivators are um effectively getting every square inch of soil um so yeah so i basically park that budding finger weeder after it starts running and i switch over to this um sweep machine for the rest of the season um, that and hopefully not a whole lot of this hand weeding this year was is a nightmare year for me and my strawberries it's the worst looking field I've ever had um, we had it looking good and clean going into August and then the gallon zoga all the rain there's no break and like getting a good you know, cultivation and, and killing of weeds, you'd cultivate and it would rain and, you know, things just re regrew, especially Gallanzoga. Um, so I went through, I actually went through and kind of gave the Gallanzoga a haircut a few times with the bush hog or flail mower, just set it high um, to just try to get some light into the row and try to see if the strawberries would come through. Um, we finally got a frost like last week or 
sometime really late. So the Gallanzoga finally got a little toasted, but it wasn't a good frost. So it's still kind of alive. Um, anyway, I'm sure other people felt that. So here's my old way of irrigating. I got the three inch aluminum pipe, rainbirds, and just blasting tons of water and sucking down my pond and watering the whole field and then having to move this stuff around all the time. Um, it was always a big chore and working around it, cultivating around it. Um, so moving it to drip tape has I been- need some water. Okay. I'm, I'm actually talking to a bunch of people. You can't see them, but they're, they're there. So um, anyway, I, yeah, I recommend, you know, I do hate plastic, but the drip tape, buried drip tape in the row is a great thing. Um, spraying strawberries. I've been a big advocate for foliar feeding. I just like uh, the response I see with, um, and I have one of these orchard sprayers. Uh, we also manage a uh, hundred full-size apple trees. So I bought this sprayer. Um, I used to have a boom sprayer. And after I got this thing, I'll never look back. It was not, it was like three grand or something. And now I can like foliar, I mean, I can hit like a 30 foot swath with this um, and it just takes no time. Uh, spraying is my least favorite thing to do. Um, I don't spray uh, the only, pesticides that I use on the strawberries have been uh, the oxidate and the sil matrix. I've never had to spray for insect pests in my strawberries. Um, and I attribute that to just good rotation. Um, I also uh, make hay. We have a lot of hay on, the, on our farm. We put up uh, between six and 7,000 bales of hay a year and I will not cut the hay around my berry field until after fruit set. So um, avoiding the tarnished plant bug, um, just keeping all those pests in the grass um, is key. Um, so yeah, I leave the grass long around my strawberry fields and you'll see a little bit of it on the edges, but as long as um, you time it right, uh, you should be able to avoid pest problems. Um, let's see what, but the fungal issues you do not escape by, um, by delaying your cutting of hay. So um, leaf spot has been the biggest issue for me in strawberries. Um, it's just, it's uh, in, uh, what's it called? Angular leaf spot. Um, anyway, so that comes with uh, heavy dews or a lot of rain. This year, I didn't spray once because we were in a drought. Um, we were all a little drought? worried. That's when it doesn't rain. Um, we were all really worried about um what the strawberry crop was going to look like this year without a lot of rain because um yeah it was I was worried this spring <laughs> but uh anyway it was great for the strawberry crop we had a awesome crop of berries we uh harvested well people harvested uh 14,000 pounds off of the two acres uh we didn't have to close at all for like four weeks we were open for picking people were coming it was fun it was a great year great year compared to last last year was awful so it made up for it so anyway i use oxidate and sill matrix to stay on top of the leaf spot um i haven't seen enough botrytis or um yeah like the gray mold or anything like that to warrant uh spraying we did have uh bird damage this year 
it was my first year dealing with the birds. So the sparrows were a pain in the butt um, this year and the cedar wax wing. So I was putting bird scare tape out everywhere and whatever. There was enough to go around this year. So um, we let it have, let them have a little bit. Um, hey, Ben. I'll change. Yes. Uh, yeah. Just before you leave that slide, there's a question. Which uh, make and mill of sprayer is that? Oh, that's a Swihart, it's called. Um, I think it's called Swihart. It's a guy out of Indi uh, Iowa, I think. Um, he shipped it over here. It's, uh, yeah, Swihart Tools, I believe, or S W I H A R T super nice guy to deal with he even sent me like a complimentary pocket knife <laughs> uh mulching is the most important part of growing a quality crop of strawberries after keeping them weeded mulching plays into keeping them weeded as well so I've learned to really not skimp on straw. It's not worth skimping on it. Um, I hear people using row cover to mulch through the winter. That's only one, uh, one role of the straw is to, you know, um, protecting them from that freeze thaw in the winter. Um, straw plays a huge part in the spring and the picking year of berries. So a uh, 40 pound bale should get you 20 row feet of like a nice thick bed of straw. Um, I borrowed a machine from a friend a few years ago and I used it for like a half an hour. Um, it was like a barrel, bale shredder. You stick the bale in the drum and it spins and it has these teeth and it spits it out and it just did a terrible job. Um, we do it by hand. So I load up a hay wagon. I can fit like 150 bales on a wagon and I drive it down the field and somebody tosses them off both sides and we hit pretty much uh, seven rows, like 200 feet long seven rows 200 feet basically one wagon will do that swath so i've stopped trying to do all the whole field at once um it's one of those things it's like as soon as the ground gets uh that early when it's frozen early in the morning that's the perfect time to start mulching strawberries is when the ground is just hard enough that you can drive a hay wagon full of straw and not get stuck, toss the bales off and then turn off the tractor and get out there and hopefully you have some good company and, uh, or if you're into listening to podcasts, go meditate and spread some straw. So we can usually get through a, um, a wagon of straw and with like a, I like to have like three or four people out there and then we can get through it in like two or three hours. And uh, maybe we'll do two, up to two um, wagon loads in a day tops. Um, it's usually like a morning chore and then move on, move on to something else in the afternoon. So anyway, the point is get a nice thick layer of straw, like six inches. Um, and then in the springtime, you will have enough straw that you would put out for yourself in the fall to really get good coverage. Um, and the raking is important. Um, you really wanna get this right. You can see in the picture here, I leave a lot of straw in the row. Um, so, you want to really just lightly rake off the row, just enough to just get that matting off of your of your plants to let the crowns start growing, and they'll grow up through a lot of straw. 
You don't need to get it down to the bare dirt. You don't want to get it down to the bare dirt. Um, you want a lot of um, mulch in the row as well as in the pathway. Um, <clears throat> so eventually, you know, they, they start growing, they start looking like this. Um, you can see I mound that straw like in the row and I really emphasize to anybody who's raking for me, I do rake, I rake, I have other people raking. We, uh, you want straw right up to the base of those, of, of the, uh, of the row, right up to the edge of the row. It's really important. Um, if you have good straw, good mulching, um, you can have fields that look like this. No herbicides. Um, and, and it, in here, you can see all the straw in the row. So when those berries form and they fall, you don't want them falling on bare dirt. You want them on nice, clean straw. <coughs> People will really appreciate it um, when they go out there picking of not having dirt, um, bare ground. And it's not good. Everybody knows you don't want bare ground ever if you can avoid it. Um, the other great thing about having a good, uh, um, good mulching is like this spring, we were in a drought and I had good soil moisture still. I didn't irrigate my berries at all this year. Um, a lot of people were, a lot of growers were. Um, and uh, I had good soil moisture. So that's another reason to be heavy with the mulch. Um, so we do probably 95% of our berries go with, uh, with pickers, the uh, pick your own crowd. Um, we have a great following. Um, they're just clamoring at the gate. Like, like Aaron and Becky said, they sell themselves. Um, strawberry fever is strong in June. And actually, in May, as soon as it gets warm, the strawberry fever comes on. Um, it's always a really anxious time of year for us. And sort of, when do you open? When, I, I've, I've gotten uh, more relaxed about it now. I'm like, I'm a little more confident about timing the opening. So. I basically go out and start picking as soon as there's ripe berries. I pick for the store. I pick for our farmer's market and uh, I'll go out with a bunch of courts and I, I like to pick into a court and go down the row until I fill up the court and leave it in the pathway, move on to the next court. And that's kind of how I gauge um, the density of strawberries. So if I'm picking a, you know, if I'm picking a flat of berries, that's eight quarts over like a half of a row or like a hundred feet. That's not enough. <clears throat> it's not enough to open for the, uh, the you pick. Uh, you have to be picking a quart probably in like five feet or less um, because we get a ton of people out there and you can't have people crawling all over each other. So we have this egg system. And I mean, we manage to have like, I, I think we've had up to like a hundred people out on our field at one time. And um, it takes a lot of really close management. So I have a field manager, and we have somebody work in the cash register. And I usually have like maybe four people, three or four people working the strawberry field. Um, 
at any point during the day when we're busy, but it's like early morning is when everybody comes to pick berries, even though the picking is better in the afternoon after we've had some warmth and sunshine, the berries get sweeter. And I always encourage our locals to come out, let the people from away come in the morning and crowd themselves and my local people, I tell them, wait until the afternoon, come out here, you'll have the whole field to yourself and the berries are better anyway. So, um, <clears throat> so I guess this is average yields. We've had yields all over the board, all across the board. Last year was awful. We, I think we were open for like four days or something. And I mean, the yields were terrible. Everybody had a bad strawberry year. There was like a late frost and the winter before it was lots of uh, winter kill. Even with good mulching, we had winter kill. There was a lot of freeze thaw. Um, a lot of, uh, we had a few of these like tropical rain events in the winter. I don't know if you all remember that, but it was bad. Um, so we're up close to three bucks a pound. Some people say that's too cheap. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's a good price and I think we get a good return, um, as long as we are good on our management side. Um, I'm not, not sure what next year is going to look like, but, um, we stopped retailing quarts of strawberries. We are just doing pints, um, labor, labor costs are way higher now. Um, everybody know we don't need to talk about that, but, um, so, you know, we've had to increase our prices, but the pick your own price, does that have to be increased? I don't think so, because I mean, three bucks a pound, that's a good price. The conventional eyes have been two and, uh, three, I feel good about. So I've thought about it a lot. Um, Renovation, I'm not going to talk much about this. I don't think it's worth it. My neighbor had a bunch of sheep that we used one year to renovate. They, it was pretty cool. It was interesting. They really did clear out the weeds and they did not touch the strawberries. Um, if you leave them in there long enough, they will get the strawberries. But if you can time it, um, they... There was clover and oats, volunteer oats, and they, they did a good job cleaning the field, but it was still pretty weedy the next year. So I don't think so that um, this is getting into our rotation. <coughs> land base, land requirement. Um, I think Eric and Becky did a good job talking about that. Um, I'll talk about at the end, I think I have a slide about what we're moving into um, for this year and the coming years. Um, so I have, I do grow rye. I don't try to grow all of my own rye, but I do. I'll bail up what I what I have in rye, and um, it's the best quality straw that I grow. But it's also kind of a pain in the butt because you can't just leave the rye whole and long because it's like rope. So what I do is I I mow it and then I swat. I put power conditioner. So I make these windrows and then I drive a flail mower. First year I did this, I left it whole and bailed. And then when I went, to, when we were spread, it was a nightmare to spread because it was just a big knot tangle when you open the bales and it didn't fall apart nicely like you want your straw to be when you're mulching. <coughs> Pardon me. Hey, Ben, this is CJ. I just wanted to do a time check on you. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm almost done. All right. Am I what? Am I over the time? No, we're pretty free, but we're getting, um, you know, another five minutes or so. Okay. Yeah. This is my last, my last one. Okay. So this just talks a little bit about making straw. I'm not going to go into that. Um, you know, I'm really interested in the no-till movement and the regenerative movement that's happening and try to think about how to work strawberries into that. And I haven't really wrap my head around it. I do have some kind of far-fetched ideas about what could work. Um, but in the meantime, we're gonna go strawberries. And then after strawberries, I work the field. I, I bought a, uh, a subsoiler this year, like a yeoman plow. So that's been a, a nice addition. Um, you really get a, a good tillage without flip soil. So it basically is like pulling a plow through, but there's no plow pan and there's no soil inversion, but it creates this wave of soil. Uh, you need a lot of ho horsepower to pull it, but um, I was able to pull that through the strawberry field after I mowed it and then disc that a few times and then I planted my oats um, and then next year that that field will go into row crops I'll grow my my squash pumpkins tomatoes um, onions and hemp um, on that two acre field um, and then after those crops come out or while they're growing I maybe I will overseed some winter rye and then the next year go into a, um, a I like the biennial cover crops um, I had really great luck with yellow sweet clover one year it's a beautiful cover crop gets huge and has a great tap root and the and the good bugs love it um, I had a really I loved growing that crop one year so I want to do it again and then that'll go back into berries um, the following year so I do a three-year rotation that's three years out of strawberries and so far so good um, so establishment year picking year and then three years out of berries and then back into strawberries so it's I have 10 acres that I can basically uh, work around strawberries. They are our priority. They are our bread and butter. Um, it brings a lot of people to the store. We basically do like a fifth of our business in that month um, for the year. So it's a huge boost for our business. And um, yeah, it's fun. So thanks guys. Okay, thank you, Ben.